No one could be reached to accept the charges for this call. Oh. To charge this call to your card, enter your card number now. For a collect call, press 1-1. To charge this call to another number, press 1-2. For person-to-person -person and all other calls, press 0 for the operator. Please hold for operator assistance. We're sorry, we could not process your request. <laughs> if you require international dialing instructions, please refer to the front page of your phone directory. If you require busy line verification, please hang up and dial 611. Oh, goodness. Please stay on the lot. Oh, maybe we will get an operator. Interestingly, I have a phone book. That's how operator, how can I help you? Hi, I'm trying to place a call to the uh, UK. To where, sorry? Uh, the UK. Okay. Uh, actually, hold on here. Uh, I got to disconnect here. Just a second. Or go over the air. Uh, understandably so. Well, let's see. Hi, uh, is this Dr. Uh, Roy Shestowitz? Is his number? Yes. Yes. Is uh, this this isn't Roy though, is it? No. Is he available? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Is he available today? Um, Roy's uh, working. Oh, he's working right now. Yeah, okay. He's he on shift. Uh, this is Jeff. I had arranged to uh, uh, interview him today. Um. Okay. Just a second. Okay. Hi, Jeff. Hello? Um, Jeff, I think, um, I don't know, because uh, Rose Sheep is like, you know, he, uh, he's working sometimes half, um, half past five, sometimes, you know, early in the morning, so um, the day is working up from half past five and five until one o'clock in, you know, uh, in the morning. Okay. So, yeah, so I don't think he can do the interview today. All right. Well, sorry to bother, the, to bother you in that case. Yeah, okay, so, okay, so probably uh, he's going to send you an email or an email to, to um, reschedule it um, again. Okay, yeah, we can, we'll, we'll reschedule over email then. Okay. All right. Okay, so, okay. You have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, bye-bye. Oh, well. We had definitely arranged that, but I guess there's also the time zone problem as with previous days. So that that is kind of a bit of a letdown, but that's okay. We'll, we'll see if we can follow up later on. But anyway, uh, as usual, um, uh, following up that, I do have a piece of media. I'm not 100% sure of the license on this one. This could be kind of pushing the line a little bit. If you go to where you find this particular piece of media, uh, the website clearly says uh, that you can 
kind of download it and listen to it. Uh, but I, I wanted to kind of bring it out uh, from the archives of history here uh, in that it's a really moving piece. And it's a moving piece with a political message that was specifically uh, made for to, to, to highlight the, the way that a particular person looked at the world and saw things. And it was at the funeral of one Samori Marksman, who must have been one of the volunteers at WBAI in the late 90s and uh, up to the year 2000, which is when his funeral took place. Now, I don't really know all that much about Samori Marksman. All I see is the number of people who came out to that funeral and gave testimony of maybe what kind of an awesome person he was and how much he stood up for the, the interests of justice and those who got the short end of the stick in so many ways. And so this song was one of the things that was performed at that funeral. So hopefully I don't get too much uh, copyright hassle for this one, but let's give it a listen. This song I wrote quite a few years ago is a tribute to the memory of Maurice Bishop, and it is, it is entitled Fighters Mourn Two. I've been on the earth long enough to know Freedom fighters come and freedom fighters go And I wrote this song to help us in some way I want my people to grow stronger every day And I should know Cause I'm a fighter Possibilities of what you really can bring And our leaders, yes, they let the switch fall But it's up to every man and woman to make their mark And I should know Cause I'm a fighter And fight is more than two, yeah Oh, well they more like me and you, yeah should know yeah so that uh was i don't know it just sends shivers down my spine every time i listen to it and i was listening to it on the way to saskatoon which is where i currently am having been in thunder bay for six years and now i've made the huge drive or the, the long drive back uh to find myself in my parents i was so demeaning being 36 and 
being on the <laughs> kind of back where I started. But hey, it's 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 progress in a way because there's a lot of stuff going on in Saskatoon. And I've got the apartments lined up waiting, just waiting for one of them to, to uh, for the paperwork to go through uh, or, or, or something along those lines. Uh, things are moving. So uh, things are moving very quickly for me personally. Uh, but in the meanwhile, it has been quite a trip this week. Uh, so many kilometers of driving, uh, driving, as I kind of pointed out earlier on my Fediverse feed, I got to drive like right into the setting sun, listening to Pink Floyd set the controls for the heart of the sun. That kind of described the trip for me anyway, but uh, very long trip, very, very uh, uh, beautiful trip. Uh, the the scenery uh, uh, in Northern Ontario this time of year, it's not, it's not as beautiful as it is in perhaps the fall, but you pass by like lakes and forests and, and rocks and trees. And uh, it's, it's just amazing to go through. And I, I kind of wanted to stop a little bit more along the way, but at the same time, there's stuff to do. You, you kind of have to, to plow through uh, some of the beautiful things in life to get to the things that are worth doing. And so given that our guest didn't show up, I guess I'll have to close some of the tabs describing him. Oh yeah, it is, I, I'm kind of doing this uh, without my instructions that I'd normally have, just the way that uh, things are set up here. But what is this show? What, what are you listening to with all this technical difficulties and getting a hold of people and stuff? This is an alternative to the RIA, the MPAA, Netflix, the IFPI, and possibly stuff like the NBA as well. Uh, and that if you are paying attention now to this and me and my voice, you are not paying attention, hopefully, to a Netflix screen. So you can rest assured that at least as far as I am concerned, I am not trying to take your freedoms away. I'm not trying to take your ability to use computers away. I'm not taking your ability to learn about the universe and the world you live in away as Netflix and the RIA and the MPAA are doing so. So what is going on this week and this past couple of weeks other than me moving to Saskatoon personally? Uh, one thing uh, that has been going on in the past little while is that I learned about something that happened a long time ago. Uh, I have been one of the few people I think that freaks really far out about anti-terror law. And one thing happened with Canada's anti-terror law that it totally escaped me at the time that it happened, uh, which is that the original anti-terror, or one of the original anti-terror laws, uh, the anti-terror law of 2001, had one of its provisions struck down, kind of, I, I don't know if it was just like really quietly done or what, but somehow uh, I missed this. And I was listening to Off the Wall, a radio show, on, I think it's WUSB, um, the archives, uh, of that show from 2007, and they mentioned that the part part of the Canada Anti-Terror Law of 2001 was struck down in February 24, 2007. And so, sure enough, you look it up, and there's a couple articles that kind of describe this. And so, uh, going into one of them from the Grok base here, quote. Uh, five Muslim or five Arab Muslim men has been have been held for years under the quote security certificate unquote program, which the Justice Department has said is a key tool to fight against global terrorism and essential to Canada's security. Uh, the court found that the system violated the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Canada's Bill of Rights. However, it suspended its ruling for a year to give Parliament time to rewrite part of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act that covers that certificate process. Now, I read the that. Act, I don't remember seeing that part. Now, maybe it's just like really subtle or, or something, but I, I, I just missed it. Uh, maybe I just wasn't looking for it, but uh, it's interesting that that's where this particular provision is. So anyway, quote, the security certificates were challenged by three men from Morocco, Syria, and Algeria, all alleged by the CSIS to have ties to terror networks, ties to terror networks. So they weren't actually terrorists. They weren't actually guilty of killing anyone or harming anyone. They just had, quote, ties to terror networks, which in the world of six degrees of separation, we all have ties to terror networks. Some of our ties are closer than others. Um, and for sure, um, especially in, in places like the Middle East, uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of terrorist, uh, officially uh, so-called terrorist uh, groups. 
um, out there. And it is plausible that you could have a, a, a cousin or something like that that is part of these networks. It's, it's not unthinkable. Now, it's not just the Middle East where terrorism occurs, of course. Uh, there's the IRA in Ireland and uh, the FL, FLQ in Quebec. And uh, I, I, I've never actually seen a whole list of all the groups that Canada even considers to be uh, outside of the Middle East or not, uh, ter actual terrorist groups. Um, but there, there's a good couple. And so it's not impossible that you could have ties to them. Uh, just like I, I, I found in Thunder Bay, just the number of organized crime groups. Now, organized crime groups are different than terrorist groups, but there's so many of them that it's very likely that you are probably, if you live in Thunder Bay, you probably know someone who's involved with one of these groups. Just the sheer numbers of it. And so same, same sort of thing, although to a lesser extent, with terrorists, right? And so if they can take you and arrest you for your ties to the group, uh, and just hold you without trial in prison. Um, that That is something, right? So anyway, continuing on, quote, the court said the treatment of the sub suspects was a violation of their rights. The overarching principle of fundamental justice that applies here is this, before a state can detain people for significant periods of time, so in this case, what do they say, five years? So like basically right after 9-11, all the way through till 2007, and then they, they let them have another year to screw around and keep them locked away, again, without tr trial, without charge, without having them done anything wrong other than have people in their life that do things that are wrong. And sure, like if someone is guilty of actually committing terrorism or plotting and doing some kind of terrorist activity, that is kind of in the, the realm of things that you could probably justifiably go to jail for, right? But that's not what these men were charged with. These men were charged with just having ties. Actually, and they weren't even charged, they were just held for just having ties. So anyway, uh, quote, the challenge law allows sensitive intelligence to be heard, heard behind a closed door by a federal judge, and I'll pause there, without a lawyer present. They don't mention that part, but if you have a lawyer present at that uh, trial, the lawyer is has then ties to a terrorist group, i.e. through you, so they wouldn't do that, or, or at least they probably wouldn't do that if they, if they were uh, uh, concerned about their own neck and not, and not getting locked away for years and years and years without charge or trial, and only having these kangaroo courts held in secret without a lawyer present uh, to get them out. So anyway, quote, with only sketchy summaries given to defense attorneys. Uh, again, so the, even if you have a lawyer and the lawyer is willing to risk being thrown into this revolving door prison where you can get locked away for doing nothing other than having a, a contact the wrong with the wrong person, even then the defense attorney, the attorneys aren't given the information they need to actually properly defend you if you are in fact innocent. So continuing on, quote, the court and the men, or said the men and their lawyers should have a right to respond to the evidence used against them by intelligence agents. Stockwell Day, the Minister of Public Safety, noted that because the ruling does not take effect for a year, the certificates would remain in place, so that the government would address the court's ruling in a timely, device or decisive fashion. Okay, so that was 12 years ago. Now, what happened after that? Going a little bit ahead, 2014, so this is after, oh, Toronto Star, your website is so slow. It had loaded earlier. Okay, anyway, Supreme Court, the Supreme Court upholds security certificate law in the Mohammed Harkat terror case. So the it was an 8-0 decision in 2014 that a special kind of or a kind of special detention warrant issued against Algerian-born Mohammed Harkat is reasonable. So basically what happened was the conservative government got slapped for having an unreasonable and illegal and rights infringing program. So they rewrote the law and in 2008 put it back into the books. So quote the conservative government's 2008 redesign of the security certificates that brought in the security related or security cleared special advocates who had access to street secret state evidence, although they are not allowed to discuss that or disclose that evidence to the defense. So <laughs> the defense still can't get the evidence needed to uh, prove whether or not you're innocent, uh, which is normally how kind of the court of law will or the, the rule of law works. If you're an innocent person, if you're given the evidence against you, you can argue against it. So again, this is assuming 
the, that the person is innocent, which of course we should do. There's no real reason on the, the, the court side why we would just assume someone guilty. Because otherwise, why do we even need a court? Why do we need a trial? Why do you need anything? Why not just like arrest them, lock them away, right? If they're guilty and you know they're guilty, then there is no need for a trial. The whole point, the whole purpose of a trial is to determine whether or not they need to be locked away. And in this case, it wouldn't take much. Like if someone's actually part of an Al-Qaeda sleeper cell and there's evidence for it, like the laws are super crazy about that. And to some extent, justifiably so, right? If you're willing to blow up a building or something like that, and you actually try to do it, then sure, get arrested. But again, these people are, are not at that point. They haven't been, they haven't had their day in court at all. So as far as we know, as outsiders to the both Al-Qaeda and the Canadian government, they may as well be considered still innocent, right? Anyway, and then they kind of talk about how uh, the particular person in question is a zero, uh, a very low risk person, and that if he gets sent back to Algeria, he'll probably be tortured. And uh, let's see here. They accused him of being in a sleeper cell, which again is 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 more a matter of like who is he in contact with? Did he actually do anything? And so how long did they hold him? Uh, let's see if it says here. And so they the conservatives modeled up after a British regime, which again is not super great because the British would just kidnap and torture people willy nilly in the. Uh, occupied Irish territories like it's it's not exactly a great thing that they uh, that they did that so quote outside of a outside the court a dedica dedicated group of supporters stood with signs saying quote no secret trials in Canada unquote which is exactly part of the problem here um, that yes these these 9-11 era laws are still on the books and that you can get locked away and the only trial you'll get is a secret trial where, you, where you're not even really allowed to have access to the, the legal defense that, I mean, it's bad enough that the legal free legal defense is pretty underfunded and like they've overworked and they're, they're probably just going to force you to settle and plead guilty or whatever anyway. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of problems on that side. When you're, when you're not even allowed that, when you're not even allowed to defend yourself from the state, from the government when it decides that you've done something wrong with no, perhaps no evidence whatsoever. That is, again, so it starts to become quite the problem. Uh, so the uh, Canadian Council for Refugees intervened in this particular case, uh, and they have a little bit of statistics on this. And that, this is what one of the things I found interesting on this article. So there was 30 security certificate proceedings in the past 22 years. There's a huge upswing in the use of secret evidence in closed door proceedings in a range of other civil proceedings, notably immigration matters. Since 2008, the federal court has conducted secret proceedings in more than 100 cases of judicial review of decisions such as sponsorship applications, where Ottawa cites national security is a reason to bar a public hearing. So in other words, this, this, this hasn't just been like a, a law on the books that they haven't been using, right? They have, this hasn't been a case of Oh, it's 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 a bad law. Everyone freaked out in, over 9/11, and but it's not like they use this. Well, no, they have been using it. They've been using it. There have been secret courts and secret findings of these courts going on for 12, almost 12 years now. And this seems to be still valid law. Uh, they are there are still going to the uh, Wikipedia page. There does still seem to be some appeals going on at least as of the past couple of years. I don't know how accurate the uh, security certificate Wikipedia page is. The case that they mention is being still on appeal is Jabala versus Canada, bracket, Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Uh, that's been a while ago now. So maybe that's actually finished. It might be something to look up for later. But uh, it's it's interesting that we, ha we live in this country with secret courts, with secret laws, and all of this kept from us, the, the general public. And th the only way out, of course, is to get rid of the liberals and the conservatives and actually start changing the laws that the conservatives and then the liberals put into place to, to make these, this, this star chamber possible, to make it so that a, an innocent person can be locked away for basically ever for doing nothing illegal whatsoever. Anyway, continuing on. That that that's an interesting thing that I mean I found this past week, but it's not the only thing, of course. The other thing is the rebel media sent an email out uh, with a petition to stop uh, section 13 of the 
uh, Human Rights Act. Human Rights Act, right, okay. So, but going back on this one, this is another one that goes back a long way. And this goes back really to about 2013 when the Harper government was still in power. And it's probably actually to a large extent because of one person, Ezra Levant, and his constant uh, hitting on this particular uh, provision that made it illegal. And I, and I remember when this was still valid law, that you could get in a lot of trouble for quote unquote hate speech. And so like when we signed up for a computer accounts at the University of Regina, even just getting access to the account and every time we got that login, we get a piece of paper telling us that there were certain things you couldn't say. And there were certain things you couldn't express using your account, whether it be on your web page or by email or however else you use the computer that for whatever reason, there were, there were certain ideas you could not express. And some of it was the, written in the, the terms of this quote unquote hate speech provision. And so you weren't allowed to hate, you weren't allowed to express hate. And that was uh, just kind of the way things were for a long time. But they make a good point. Let's see if I can find it here. This, this is from the National Post, which again, National Post, take with a bit of a grain of salt. But it, quote, section 13 had actually stopped being used as a shield as I think it was intended to protect civil liberties and started being used as a sword against Canadians. And it's because it was a poorly written, and it's because it was a poorly written piece of legislation in the first place. That was Alberta Conservative MP Brian Storseth, who I guess passed the bill to remove it. And it was, it was they considered it a, a tool to help, quote, curb hate speech, which, I mean, curbing hate speech is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Uh, as long as it's allowed and as long as the government is not restricting what people can say less hate is probably well, it is a good thing uh, getting people to get along that's a good thing but enabling people to censor each other and to give one group of people uh power to restrict what another group of people uh say uh that that is problematic so uh, they talk about how it's a problematic from a freedom of expression point of view. They ask Richard Warman, uh, who, quote, has brought 16 successful Section 13 complaints before the Human Rights Tribunal against neo-Nazis and white supremacists since 2001. Richard Warman has kind of made it a bit of a name for himself in doing that sort of thing and using the law to, to silence people. And it's not surprising that he would be upset with part of the law that allows him to do that going away. But that this just is, is kind of the context here because they're talking about bringing it, the, the liberal government is talking about bringing this back. Now, we know just like we the, the, the previous story, like we, we know this isn't just some kind of an idle threat. This isn't just some kind of a law that's going to be put on the books and then it's going to make everyone feel better and then nothing else will come of it. Because there are people like Richard Warman out there who will use it, who will, as soon as it's law, go out there and try to get people to be silenced using it. So here, here's what the rebel says anyway, quote, Stephen Harper's conservatives voted to re repeal Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act of 2013. That's the censorship provision that made it an offense to hurt someone's feelings. But now the Liberals are looking to bring it back, and to my horror, Andrew Scheer's Conservatives haven't lifted a finger against it. Pause. You shouldn't be surprised at this. The Conservatives have always been about censorship and using the law to restrict what people can say. Now, in this case, maybe the particular things that are going to be that this particular law are going to be directed to may fall within the sort of things that Conservatives generally say. That may be possible, but we shouldn't be surprised at all that the conservative government might use its ability or, or use its voice or not use its voice in the case of this particular situation to, to allow the government to get more powerful and allow the censors to get more powerful. That, that is not surprising at all. So anyway, continuing on, they are not actively cheering it on, that I can see, but they have made a team decision party-wide to not champion freedom of speech. I can't name a more important issue for conservatives, actually. Pause. Again, <laughs> it's, it's funny seeing him say this because the conservatives have a really long history of restricting freedom of speech. And like, it's, it's not like 
<laughs> they're the party of freedom at all. Like they're they're the anti party of freedom on it, or the the party of anti freedom in this case. So it's not an important issue for the conservatives, and we shouldn't expect it, them to actually do that. It would be surprising that if they actually did. That would be an interesting thing. But we shouldn't let them have this this appearance of the high road. This is not your issue. You guys will fail on this one. We can expect that. Anyway, continuing on. It's more important than taxes or immigration or fighting terrorism and respecting our military. It's more important than any trade deal, more important than any criminal or than criminal justice. Because if you don't have free speech, you can't talk meaningfully about any of those other issues, which is exactly correct. That part, he totally nails it there. You need the freedom to express ideas in order to have solutions to problems like terrorism and immigration and taxes to be able to come to a a Cons at least something approaching consensus where our leaders and the, the the citizens who feed information into them can at least find their way through the space of possible policies and meaning er, and arguments that they could have with each other to find something that works and something that isn't inhumane and you can't do this if your government continues down the path of restricting what people can and cannot say so continuing on, quote, when he ran for the leader of the conservatives, Scheer promised to fight for free speech. <laughs> Again, we're taking conservatives for what they actually say. Uh, Scheer is a liar. We can verify that here in this case, but we shouldn't be surprised that conservatives lie to get elected. I mean, when has that ever happened, right? So continuing on, especially on campus, he sounded good on that. But since then, he's literally deleted that policy from his website. You can't find it. And he's gone wobbly out of fear of the media, fear that he'll be demonized too. Well, he's a conservative. Like you can't, it's like trying to demonize Satan. Like it's too late, buddy. <laughs> You're already a conservative. It's like, it just... There's no recovery from being the leader of the Conservative Party in Canada. There just isn't. Like, you can't recover. You might as well be that 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 uh, that uh, opponent of anything decent in the world. Anyway, continuing on. During recent hearings on the subject, as at the liberal-run justice community, Michael Cooper, a Conservative MP from St. Albert, dared to push back at the hateful assertion by Muslim lobbyists that Conservatives were to blame for mass murder in New Zealand. Well they kind of were uh it would not be uh really unreasonable to to put the particular murder in new zealand into the camp of conservatives and people who want to conserve western or or uh, european culture like that does seem to be what he was into but he also was uh considered himself to be something on the left so I, that particular case is not as clear cut as it might seem, and uh, so it, it's 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 an interesting one. But like we we should own to the extent that that particular mass murder happened to the extent that he kind of agrees with our positions, and that he, he from my understanding he had a lot of uh, shared. I, I guess he shared a lot of what he thought with the conservative side and the left as well. So it's it's. It, I don't think it's necessarily honest to just like completely say, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm, he's not my kind of conservative or, or he's not my kind of socialist. No, he, re he really kind of was. Uh, so there, there's that. Anyway, con continuing on saying that terrorist himself denied that he was conservative. In fact, he admired communist China. So again, he, he was more on the left than on the, uh, the right, but it, I don't, I don't think it's as clear cut as that uh, either. So but continuing on, it was true that it was a rebuttal to a false accusation, but after the Liberals say, said that they were offended, Scheer literally fired Cooper. And weirdly, Scheer ordered the remaining Conservatives on the committee to turn off video cameras when Mark Stein, Lindsay Shepard, and John Robson testified at the committee. How crazy is that? The Conservatives invited them to testify, presumably for free speech, and then they showed up, and then the Conservative MPs literally voted to turn off the camera so the world couldn't see them arguing for freedom. This right here, th this is probably what makes this story, that there is still people standing up for the right to express what needs to be expressed in Canada. There are still people fighting for it. The, there is still media outlets where you can find out about this. There is still the people here have not given up our, our concept of ancient freedoms and rights 
as the Romans did when their empire was falling. But at the same time, what is the government doing in reaction to that? And it's not even just what the government is doing, it's what the, the, the opposition, the, the conservatives are doing. I mean, it's, it's bad enough that the conservatives are doing it, but they shouldn't have been able to, to control that. Like the liberals really should have been able to stop that, did they? No, they didn't. Otherwise, it would have looked even worse for them, right? So it, it, it would have been a political victory for the liberals to, to oppose this uh, silencing of uh, freedom fighters here in Canada, and they didn't. So that, that's kind of doubly bad for them. But it's, it's just a really bizarre situation. So but what is going on? Why is not a single conservative MP allowed to even talk about this issue? quote unquote. That's probably because they're whipped. You are supporting a whipped party. This is what whipped parties do. And it, especially post Harper, when the head of the party became kind of the, the only place where policy can really be pronounced out of. This is what the conservative and liberal parties are about. And I know that the rebel really kind of has a hard on for the conservatives, but this, this is what they do. And so you can't ignore that. This is like it's kind of hard to, to pull an example, but it's like uh, you, you can't fault <laughs> the PCs in Alberta for supporting the oil industry. Like that, that's just, it, it would be stupid to even do that because that's what they are. They are the pro oil party. They, they don't hide it. They don't try to bullshit you about it. If you vote for the oil party, you're going to get an oil party. If you vote for a party that whips its members and restricts their ability to express things on issues, whether or not it is harmful or beneficial to the Canadian public that they are supposedly be are supposed to be serving, well, th that's what you get. This is what whipped parties do. This is why Elizabeth May and the Green Party is actively trying to change the way Parliament worked or works over the past couple of years, so that individual MPs can actually represent those who elect. And yes, Elizabeth May isn't perfect. And maybe if you're a conservative, there's a lot of things that you may, there are a lot of problems you'd have with Elizabeth May and her Green Party specifically. But at least she gets this right. And at least there's there's in something to compare the conservatives and the liberals, and in this case, the NDP, against. That we can actually say, no, it, it doesn't have to be this way, but we have chosen for it to be this way over the past election or two. And that the Canadian voting public saw other priorities as perhaps more important. Things like getting rid of Stephen Harper was more important than this kind of uh, procedural issue and climate change is probably more important than this kind of procedural issue but we shouldn't ignore it when it happens either when it happens and, and we th we see people like Ezra Levant in this case or, or is it actually yeah it is and throw up his hands and say oh I don't know why the party is ignoring the will of the people you know oh I don't know why they're doing this and that they're silencing their own member well again this is what the conservative party does so don't ignore it so I, I'm sure he wouldn't I, I, he, he probably wouldn't want to focus on that particular flaw in his supported party so much. But who knows, maybe he would. I, I challenge him if he ever finds this or hears about this. Yeah, do a, do a video on the uh, whipped parties and, and hit the conservatives hard for this specifically because they deserve it and they need to be hit over it, uh, at least in terms of media coverage. So anyway, uh, da -da -da. quote, uh, well, I guess there was one man who didn't vote to repeal Section 13, Andrew Scheer himself, who was the Speaker of the House and thus didn't vote. What an irony. The man who controlled everyone's freedom of speech in Parliament. The man who effectively was the judge of the Court of Parliament who could demand an MP retract a statement. Maybe, just maybe, he fell in love with the power to regulate speech. How else can you explain it? Well put, Ezra. Well put. That, that part, again... It's, this is the reason why I don't want to see the rebel banned, because every once in a while he just hits something that is absolutely true or very likely to be true, in that it's, what else explains this? Is this really who we want leading the country? Is this man who's been, for the past couple of years, practicing and, and, and becoming perhaps addicted to the ability of silencing the people who he disagrees with? He's not going to want to give this power up. He's going to want to grow this power.
that is exactly what's going to happen in this country if the conservatives are allowed to have a majority government and especially if the conservatives have a majority government but not exclusively so it could very well happen if the conservatives get a majority government and are supported by the liberals in this sort of thing because the liberals and the conservatives see eye to eye on this and uh it's very likely that it, maybe this section 13 stuff won't pass maybe the conservatives will reverse it but the ability to restrict what people say online I don't see that as, as uh, the threat of that happening is going to continue for a long time yet. So anyway, quote, uh, what if I ask you to sign or ask you to sign a petition to Andrew Scheer himself to take off the whip from his own MPs to let them be, quote, true conservatives to stand up for freedom of speech? Don't let Harper's work be undone. Don't go quietly along with Justin Trudeau and Katrina Gold. And don't, for God's sake, be an active participant in it by censoring Mark Stein and others. Pause. If you haven't read any of Mark Stein's writing, go find some of it. Go find one of his books. Never mind his, his newspaper articles and stuff like that. He, he does write books. He's one of the few people kind of still kicking around who writes long and thinks long form. And it's really obvious that he does. So, yeah, go, go find one of his books and read it. It, it might kind of wake you up a little bit. Uh, so the petition is, quote, we call upon Andrew Scheer to stand up for freedom of speech by opposing the revival of Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act. That's it. He promised for free speech when he ran for leadership. His party was un or unanimously for free speech under Stephen Harper. <coughs> yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> sure. Continuing on, the country needs free speech. We need an effective opposition. It's easy for him to do. It's If he's worried about what the country thinks, which... Clearly, clearly he's not. Uh, quote, but these days I'm worried he cares more about what the media party thinks. Da, da, da. So anyway, I'm going to share the link to this. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it may or may not make sense to sign this sort of thing because really who cares what the conservatives think or do. Uh, but I think that there should be a similar petition for the other parties and that it shouldn't just be the conservatives that do the right thing on this. We should all as a country get behind this and to, to not let this be signed into law. Like, it's, it seems to be a bit of a no-brainer on this one. But, of course, it's, it's going to be a, a, a political battle that's going to have to happen again. And it, it, it it's kind of sucks when you, you get a victory like that, where against all odds, you get just that, like, little bit of freedom return to the country, and then a year or two later, it's gone again. <laughs> it's like we have to go through the whole thing of getting the petitions out, protesting in the streets. Oh, wait, we can't do that. Thank you, Stephen Harper and Justin Trudeau, and on and on and on. Like, it's uh, it's unfortunate, but it is kind of how the democratic process works or would work if we actually lived in a democratic, uh, functioning democratic country. So who knows, maybe it could still work yet. This could be the issue to to make that happen. But somehow, again, I don't see that happening either. So close that one. What else have we got here? I think this will be the last one. So this is from Laura Loomer. Now, I don't honestly know all that much about Laura Loomer. Uh, I know she's a conservative and I know she's been, or she was one of the ones that kind of got the ax, but let's hear it in our own words. What's going on on this side? Quote, Laura Ingram lists Laura Loomer as prominent voice censored on social media. Two weeks ago by L Laura Loomer. So on Thursday night, Fox News host Laura Ingram discussed social media bias and censorship of conservatives. Big tech social media companies like Facebook and Twitter have been silent conservative voices. Pause. So, I mean, we've been talking about this over and over again, but just want to remind people it's not just conservatives who are being silenced. Uh, but conservatives are being silenced. Like, Laura Loomer is one example. So anyway, continuing on. An act which seems to only be increasing as the 2020 presidential election gets closer. No citation provided there. That's just like a A, then B, therefore... A causes B, right? Or B causes A or whatever. It's 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 trying to, to, to show that th th this happens a lot where it's like the conservatives know the election's coming closer. And so the, the closer it gets, the more the interference in their ability to express themselves, the more that they're skeptical that maybe this is to actually throw the election. And that if their side or their tribe can't speak and can't express themselves, then the election won't necessarily be a fair election because the other side can. And so, I mean, there's there's definitely something to be said for that. But at the, the same time, it could be a totally independent thing uh, or, or mostly independent thing where like the, the Twitter, Facebook, 
and other major media outlets are learning to to censor their customers in a way that works uh, and it just so happens that every four years there's an election in the states and four years ago we had the censorship the censorship has only gotten worse but at some point it's going to intersect with the election cycle so is it actually caused or is it actually like intention or intended to do that it that may even be but i don't see the evidence in this article at least so anyway continuing on during this segment ingram showed a picture of several pro quote prominent voices censored on social media the left-wing media isn't too happy about the fact that deplatformed people like myself are being discussed Quote, also featured was the conspiracy theorist Alex Jones, founder of Infowars, who claimed the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting was a government hoax. I think he apologized for that one. Um, he was wrong, apparently. Continuing on, Laura Loomer, a far-right far activist who said Muslims, quote, don't know how to assimilate and be good Americans, unquote. And Milo Yiannopoulos, a far-right anti-Muslim provocateur. Is he really far-right? He, he is on the right, but far? Anyway, continuing on, among others, including Owens. So, da, da, da. so they have a little bit of a transcript here. So, quote, I'm now banned from every single social media platform and major payment processor in the world. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, PayPal, Venmo, GoFundMe, Uber, Uber Eats, Lyft, Medium, Teespring. Now, it's interesting that she mentioned Uber. Like, is that a social network? Is that considered a social network? Like, I think I just took uber for like the second time in my life this past week because uber is in saskatoon so it's interesting that uber is being brought up here like that your politics somehow can determine whether or not you can get safely home after a night of drinking downtown like it's is that how things are going to work is that the future of transportation in saskatoon that's that's interesting to me anyway so chase bank temporarily suspended access to my online banking and canceled my debit card bitcoin user not affected my god this is just another example of why banks you should net you should not trust banks with your money she'll be lucky if that bank doesn't just take her money like people should be a little bit more aware of that this happens and it's good that maybe she can be an example for at least the conservative side of why people shouldn't trust Chase Bank with anything, at least as far as they can throw them. Uh, but I mean, it sucks to her, I'm sure, that whatever her po politics that pissed off Chase Bank, uh, that, uh, that she's unable to be part of the banking system anymore. But this is coming, like the banks, is, is it just gonna stop with this Laura Loomer? Uh, is it just gonna stop with her? Maybe, maybe it's even shitty journalism and shitty hot takes. Like who knows, right? But is is the, is it going to stop with her, or will Chase uh, Bank restrict other people? Uh, so anyway, continuing on, as reported with in the Wall Street Journal, the ban came at the instigation of the CAIR, the Council of American Islamic Relations, and it was carried out shortly by CARES meeting with Twitter executives, those who wish to support the legal defense, blah blah blah. So anyway, long story short. She has managed to get banned from a lot of freaking platforms and a lot of systems. So is the particular things that she's saying, uh, should she be saying? I, I don't even know. I don't even really care at this point because when someone gets banned that hard from Uber, like uh, Uber, that we're going to go there? Is that where we're going to have to start paying attention to? Is how people can get around outside of bikes and cars and stuff like that? Like it's... it's, it's, it's at what point has it gone too far? At what point can we just notice that the people we disagree with are just getting cut out from the society that they live in and that this power isn't going to be, it, it isn't going to stay directed at them. In time, Uber is going to use this power if it, if it gets away with this on other people. And who knows, maybe I'll be one of those people, right? So it's, it's definitely something to pay attention to. Anyway, th this show has gone long enough, especially since it's kind of cut into two parts, um, or at least two little videos. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, <laughs> the next show, uh, I'll get a, a better guest set up. I, I am going to try to get into an actual kind of studio thing uh, set up so that maybe future shows will have a little bit more production value or something. And uh, <laughs> with any luck, I won't be in my parents' house uh, for very long, but we'll see how that goes. If you have anything you'd like me to talk about, as usual, send them to me via Ricochet or direct message on whatever platform this is posted on or anywhere else I can be. 
found at this. If you want to see more of this, you can definitely support it on Subscriber Star or Villages, although I also take other things like Bitcoin as well. As well, if you have any Creative Commons or free music that you'd like to have a wider audience, definitely send me a link. I will give it a listen. And with that, that's the end of this show. Hopefully, we will see you next week at Eastern Time. God, these time, go time zones are screwing me up. Uh, six or 1845 Eastern, uh, wherever or whatever time that is in Saskatchewan. So see you then.